It's an expedition like no other before. That's our entry point. We're going to drop down in there. Dave will feed the ROV. They are among the world's foremost underwater explorers. We are going to feed Tether. It's an exploration of America's most sacred war memorial. The wreckage of the battleship USS Arizona. We want people to understand that this was a living, breathing ship. That's the door. The ship is a war grave. 1177 men died. It was devastating. It was unbelievable. The attack on Pearl Harbor, an assault no one saw coming. We thought we were invincible. They were coming right over us. And then we caught the big bomb. A blow that would sink the Arizona and change the course of history. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Now, 75 years later, that is awesome. these explorers are setting out to bring the Arizona back to life. Wow, look at that. Unbelievable. And for one survivor, it's like a homecoming. Kind of interesting to see what all the time in the sea has done with our old home. December 7th, 1941. They seem to come from nowhere. Unidentified planes appear in the sky over Pearl Harbor. Then I saw one of the planes with the rising sun on it, and I said, my god, those are Japanese planes. Flying low enough where you could see the pilots' faces. An assault nobody saw coming. United States fleet was caught napping. Our planes were parked in nice, neat rows on the ground. They were destroyed very easily. From a tactical perspective, the, the surprise element worked perfectly. It was devastating. It was unbelievable, you know, that this was happening to us. We thought we were invincible, obviously, the great United States Navy. Uh, so we felt very secure. But on December 7th, 1941, this was not enough. Undetected by US intelligence, the Japanese Empire has sent a fleet of warships, carriers, battleships, and submarines towards American soil. And at about 6.30, we got word directly to our base that the USS Ward was dropping depth charges on unidentified submarine. But Japanese submarine sightings are a common occurrence at this time, so nobody thinks an attack is imminent. It's not the only missed warning sign on this morning. Then they had a warning of all the planes coming in from the north. A new radar station located in Oahu picks up the signal. They didn't pay much time to that either. The radar operator reports the biggest sighting he had ever seen. They said, well, that's a B-17s coming from the States. Don't worry about it. But the attackers face intelligence lapses, too. We learned before we took off that there wasn't a single aircraft carrier in port. This was a big problem. The reconnaissance aircraft were supposed to look for them, but they returned before they had found the carriers. Well, it couldn't be helped. All crew members thought so. Preparations for the attack continue by Japan. For the Japanese commanders, the U.S. battleships are an important target, a decision with dire consequences. Despite the fact it knocked out of action eight American battleships, in many ways, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was a failure. 
it failed to knock out a single United States aircraft carrier. By the time of the Pearl Harbor attack, the aircraft carrier, not the battleship, was the main weapon for projecting naval power. But for now, the attack looks like a success. The sky was just black with smoke. The battleships were engulfed in flames. The Oklahoma had been torpedoed, then she killed over on the side. And then a Japanese bomber zeroes in on the USS Arizona. Over a million pounds of ammunition, 180,000 gallons of aviation gasoline, all blue. The explosion tears the battleship Arizona apart. Within minutes, the battleship sinks to the bottom of the harbor. It shocked the American people, it angered the American people, and it made the United States willing to suffer and fight for a very long time to defeat the Japanese. Seventy-five years after the attack, Pearl Harbor, Oahu, Hawaii, the site of the sunken battleship USS Arizona. While much of the ship's exterior can be seen, most of the Arizona's interior remains a mystery. But state-of-the-art imaging technology is set to change that. All right, breath's good. Researchers and divers of the U.S. National Park Service prepare for a high-stakes expedition. They are about to look deep inside the ship like never before. The sunken battleship USS Arizona, a mere shadow of her former self. Here we are on the gun, the number one guns. These three gun barrels extend out into the gloom of Pearl Harbor for some 57 feet. These encrusted weapons were once capable of heaving a 1,500-pound projectile miles into the air. The physical remains of the ship are still here. And along with those remains are artifacts on the decks all around us. Marine growth mixed with the Arizona's corrosion, covers the ship like a blanket. And we have this water picture that's been here since the attack on December 7th. A fork. A breakfast bowl. A Coke bottle. and even a sailor's shoe. Traces of life on board before the attack. They stay on the decks and they're preserved as a touchstone to the history and the events that happened here on December 7th. A moment in time that changed the world. The ship is a war grave. 1,177 men died, and many of them died right at the location that you're diving at and that you're looking at. Knowing that and seeing it up close underwater is really a moving experience. We get goosebumps, all of our divers do. Little is known about the condition of the Arizona's interior. The ship is now a naval cemetery, and no diver is allowed inside. 
We've got this opportunity to do it with scientific instrumentation in a very controlled manner that allows us to inspect what's there, what's going on, what's changed. To gauge the current state of the Arizona, the team scans the wreckage using a radio-controlled sonar device. That's good. Stay on that azimuth right there. Laser scanners survey the Arizona and help scientists develop an in-depth analysis of the wreck as it sits today. The data will be used to create a 3D computer model of the ship's exterior. At the heart of the interior exploration will be a custom-built ROV the team has named 11th Hour. Capable of exploring areas of the ship nobody has seen since the day of the attack. We can swim around the ship all we want, but until we really have an understanding of what's going on inside, we really don't know how long the ship is going to last. To build and operate this ROV, the National Park Service works with a team of world renowned underwater explorers. Oh, look at that. We get to go to places where we're frequently the first people to ever see something. And I want to I want to share that. In the past, they have explored wrecks like the Titanic or the German battleship Bismarck. And now they are key in bringing the Arizona back to life. So now for the first time, we have the ability to remove the water away from the ship and just look at the ship. People have the ability to see what the ship looks like and what's still left in the harbor 75 years later. She was called the pride of the fleet. The flagship of the Navy's first battleship division. Home to more than 1,500 men. One of them, Ensign Carl Bud Whedon, reporting for duty in the summer of 1940. For 75 years, his family has kept his memory alive and held on to the treasure trove Ensign Whedon left behind. This is my uncle's eight millimeter movie film from the 40s. These are the letters that he wrote home. Then we also, we also have a few photos. Here he is, real casual, on a sailboat. He really enjoyed his life. Then he got him to Annapolis and spent about four years there and graduated in 1940. He was very proud. A passionate photographer, Whedon documented life on board the Arizona with his 8mm film camera. He loved that movie camera. You know, those are just really priceless that, that he did that so that we have those memories of him. Some of Ensign Whedon's color films have never been aired on television before. Uh, this says Battleship, Changing of the Captains. There's a changing of the captains, and then they went down and, and did the filming in the stateroom. Also signing up for service on board the vessel that year, Seaman Don Stratton. An old country boy like me, who had, you see the Arizona sitting there tied up to the dock, it's a advance. How can 35,000 ton of steel float, you know? When launched in June of 1915, she was the US Navy's biggest battleship, a so-called super dreadnought, a class of its own. Constructed over six decks, the Arizona was a labyrinth of compartments 
crew quarters, storage rooms, boiler rooms, powder magazines, and dozens of fuel compartments. With a displacement of over 35,000 tons, she would be able to reach a top speed of 20 knots and have a range of 8,500 miles. I didn't really know what to expect, but nobody can imagine how big a ship is out of water like that. With the war looming, the battleship was overhauled in the winter of 1940. They put it in dry dock, and we went over the side and scraped the side and scraped the bottom and painted it. And, and that was quite an experience, I tell you. Stratton's battle station, the sky control platform one deck above the bridge. That was for the anti-aircraft guns. And I was a sight setter and the director for the port side. The final resting place of the USS Arizona today. Close to two million Americans and foreign visitors come to see the site of the sunken vessel every year. Don Stratton was one of the few survivors of the Arizona attack. At this moment, I would like to let everybody know to be aware of the fact that we do have Mr. Donald Stratton with us. He is an Arizona survivor. 75 years later, Don Stratton returns to see his ship once more. Kind of interesting to see what all the time in the sea has done with our old home. It would be like a homecoming, I guess, maybe, after all these years. To this day, the survivors of the Japanese attack are heroes for the American people which is why Don has come to be a part of the underwater exploration. You know, to have Don back here, and be able to participate in our project, in our research. It really means a lot having him be able to experience the ship again, like he's never experienced it since he was there, you know, 75 years ago. As one of the few Arizona sailors still alive, to this day, he wonders why he was spared. Some of the personnel did survive, and I was one of them. It's been a long time. I think about it every day, how many people didn't make it that day. Why the good Lord saved Westman? Who knows? Yeah, I love you. We shall never forget. In 1941, the world is consumed by aggression. Adolf Hitler's armies have already marched across Europe. In the Pacific, Japan is fighting a brutal war in China, trying to expand its own empire further south and exploiting the riches of the region. The Japanese believe in making an invasion pay for itself. The world at the time was very much at war. Britain was fighting for its life, uh, trying to fight convoy battles to keep the sea lanes open, air battles to protect uh, the airspace over London and key targets. The 
Nazi army had invaded the Soviet Union in June of 1941, Operation Barbarossa. In many ways, it looked as if the Axis powers were going to win. Together with Nazi Germany and Mussolini's Italy, the Japanese Empire has formed the so-called Pact of Steel. Each of these nations had aggressive foreign policies. Each of these nations relied on nationalist narratives to sell aggressive foreign policies to their people. It looked as if democracies, the Western allies, um, were going to be out of the game. But for the US, war seems distant. Most Americans are weary of being drawn into foreign conflicts. Many people in the United States saw World War I as a mistake and did not want to repeat it with another war in Europe or Asia. They didn't want to fight uh, for something they didn't understand. They saw the business of America as being free and peace-loving and staying home and being out. And with the world on fire, serving in the remote islands of Hawaii seemed a good choice. They said, well, Kale, you have your choice of worldwide assignment. I said, hell, send me to Pearl Harbor. It was idyllic. It was always a lot of music and a lot of dancing and things like that. It was just beautiful. Ensign Whedon also enjoys life on the island. He writes his sister. I've been taking a few movies. I've been doing the usual things in port this time, going swimming, sunbathing, and sightseeing around the island. We enjoyed it very much uh, until the rude awakening, of course. Pearl Harbor's tune changes in the summer of 1941. 140,000 Japanese troops pour into the French colony. They meet little resistance. Within a few days, at the cost of hardly a man, the Japanese were in possession of all of Indochina up to the border of Thailand. This was essential for the Japanese war effort because Indochina had uh, supplies of rice and rubber, which were critical to the expanding Japanese war effort. Japan, in many ways, did not set out for this. But once they started playing the game of colonialization, started playing the game of having a large modern military and using it, they realized they couldn't stop. To stop Japan from further expanding its reach in the Pacific region, President Roosevelt imposes an oil embargo against the commodity-poor country. Paradoxically, this move to try to avoid war by cutting off Japanese supplies and using diplomacy as a way to stop these aggressive actions actually emboldened hardliners. Japanese leaders calculated that they only had about a year of oil reserves left in their country. This presented the Japanese with two choices, stop their war in China or expand their war to include the United States. The Japanese Empire decides to stay in the fight. Their plan, to conquer oil wells in the Dutch Indies and the American-controlled Philippine Islands But standing in the way of Japan's ambitions in the Pacific, America's naval fleet in Pearl Harbor, ready to disrupt any invasion. The Japanese saw the US Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor as a threat to their plans. They saw this as a force that was forward deployed that could attack the Japanese mainland directly, that could interdict supplies as they came to the island nation of Japan, or could directly clash with their fleet. But for the US, the idea of an attack on Pearl Harbor is a remote thought.
Virtually no one in the United States chain of command at the time believed Pearl Harbor would be the target. It is this false sense of security that makes attacking the harbor particularly appealing to the Japanese commanders. The general assumption was that Pearl Harbor was an ideal naval base. It had a narrow entryway into its port. It had a very shallow depth of water, only between 40 and 45 feet. This was believed to make torpedo attacks or submarine infiltration into the Central Harbor impossible or very difficult at least. The Japanese, however, realized this early on and came up with an ingenious workaround. To be an effective weapon, the torpedoes would need to enter the water at a shallow angle. So Japanese engineers simply added wooden fins that would break away on entry. This allowed a well-trained pilot flying a very precise, low-speed approach to drop the torpedo for it not to sink too deep into the harbor and actually strike the sides of the American ships. Then, a Japanese Kate bomber targets the USS Arizona. One of the aviators chosen to take part in the attack, Haruo Joshi. We started torpedo training in shallow water in September. It was quite hard. All we were told was that there would be targets in shallow water. In Pearl Harbor, a Japanese attack still seems improbable to most but commanders still prepare their soldiers for war. One month before the, the war started, we started having air raid drills, which was very unusual, you know, what do we have an air raid drills for, you know, what, which means they expected something. And the crew of the battleships are out at sea, practicing for an encounter with the Japanese fleet. But no amount of training would help the United States in this surprise attack. I don't think anybody had any inkling that that was coming. But when they were out sea doing some practicing and some shooting some off some of the broadside guns and big guns and anti-aircraft guns, we figured, well, they're training us for this for some reason. One month before the attack, Ensign Whedon writes to his sister. Bernadine, I'm terribly sorry to say, but thank you all will have to forget anything about me coming home for Christmas. Japan seems to be getting on her high horse again. I can't even predict what might happen here in the Pacific, for any day Japan might think she can whip us, and then all hell will tear loose out here. Just don't you people worry about it. What is to be, will be. Meanwhile, in great secrecy, the Japanese Empire gathers the Pearl Harbor attack fleet in the waters of the Kuril Islands. On November 26, 1941, the largest naval strike force ever assembled sets sail. An armada of more than 60 vessels aircraft carriers, battleships, cruisers, destroyers, oilers, and submarines. On board the carriers, the pilots are being told what their target is. Hong Kong. The fleet was heading for Hawaii for an attack, we were told. But there were still peace negotiations with America. And if the negotiations worked out, then the attack would be canceled. So we could turn around at any time. But if the negotiations didn't work out, we would declare war.
Oahu, Hawaii, December 7th. It's a Sunday. Well, we got up and around at 5.30. On the Sunday morning, we just clean sweep down. We didn't pull a stone or we didn't scrub down or we didn't do any painting. Sunday is an off day for most on board the Arizona. Down and then chow call sounded and we went to chow. 230 miles north of Oahu, the Japanese carriers are in position to launch their attack. But weather conditions are not good. The sea was extremely agitated. The Northern Pacific is often called the devilish Pacific, but it was actually a three-headed devil Pacific. There were waves big as mountains. The airmen are called on deck. This is original footage from the morning of the attack. An order came over the loudspeakers. The appointed crew members must line up in front of the bridge. On board the carriers, 350 airplanes, zero fighters, high altitude bombers, and torpedo planes are being readied. The evening before the attack, we, the crew in the Kaga, were encouraged, and everybody went to the Shinto shrine on the ship. And there were quite a few bottles of sake, rice wine, and we put them in the airplanes. We all took it on the airplanes. Every man got two bottles. So the three plane crew members took six bottles. We could drink the sake after the attack, or we could also take it back home to Japan as a souvenir. It is 6.20 a.m. when the first wave of the strike force takes off. There didn't seem to be a reason to worry because it looked like we would be making a surprise attack. On the long wave radio, the Americans were broadcasting lively music. This seemed to indicate that they hadn't noticed the approach of the Japanese forces yet. In Honolulu, station KGMB has been on the air all night not to entertain, but to help incoming planes from the U.S. mainland to find their way. Unbeknownst to the operators on the ground, the Japanese attack force tunes to the same radio beam to guide their navigation. When we left, the weather was really not too good. When we took off from the boat, there were thick clouds and the sea wasn't calm. However, the more we approached the island of Oahu, the clouds dissolved. At Pearl Harbor, it's time for morning colors. The Sunday morning on the Pantail, we'd have church services here right after colors. An aerial photograph. A Japanese camera has captured just moments before the deadly attack. Clearly visible on the stern of the Arizona, the canvas awning for the worship service that would never take place. And right behind it, on the main deck of the repair ship Vestal, moored next to the Arizona, a movie screen still in place from the viewing the night before glimpses of a normal life just moments before the war begins. 
Across from Battleship Row at Hickam Airfield, Seaman Rodriguez has just ended his watch. At uh, 7.45, I got relief from my watch and when I have breakfast. I had just sat my tray down when we heard a lot of rumblings and we thought nothing of it. Well, I never had breakfast that morning. I was at home, and when the noise woke us up, we thought it was the Army. It wasn't. The first casualties on this morning, 35 servicemen who are having breakfast in the Hickam Airfield dining hall. On board the Arizona, Don Stratton steps onto the main deck when he suddenly hears his fellow sailors shouting. Look up forward, and there's a lot of line of sailors up there pointing and hollering and waving over at Port Island. And then the, one of the planes took a turn and I could see the rising sun and I thought, that's the Japs. The bombers were bombing the hangars and the other planes were strafing the areas, the planes on the, on the runways. They were coming right over us. And they, they were flying low enough where you could see the pilot's faces. Radio operators sent out an emergency broadcast on all frequencies. It is now 7.58 AM in Oahu. The uncoded message is the first official word of the attack that reaches Washington. Within minutes, President Roosevelt will learn of the raid. FDR is actually in the White House relaxing. He's with his stamp collection when the phone rings, and Secretary of the Navy knocks, calls him up, and gives him the first word that Pearl Harbor has been attacked. Um, the details are uncertain. FDR asks for clarification. And at this point, it's uncertain exactly what's happened. President Roosevelt anticipated that there would eventually be war with the Japanese. And even the night before, he had talked with his advisor, Harry Hopkins, about the Japanese diplomacy and the likelihood of war. But when the message finally came, um, I think even President Roosevelt, who could see in the future far more clearly than most Americans, was still surprised. The Japanese first attack the air bases with dive bombers, and then set their sights on the primary target. The battleships anchored around Ford Island. Japanese footage of the attack. Barbara's point to do now, I know. Barber's Point was the entrance into the waterway. There was the shore base. When we arrived there, other planes of the Akagi were already launching torpedoes. We went down quickly. Then, when we were only 10 meters up, we could aim for the target. Tied up next to each other, the battleships are easy prey for the Japanese pilots. Moored around Ford Island are the California, Maryland, Oklahoma, Tennessee, West Virginia, Nevada, and the USS Arizona. As the Oklahoma had a three-pillar mast, it was the easiest to hit. So I hit it with a torpedo. And I could hear this sound of guns firing when I crossed it. When I thought about it, I came to the conclusion this was not good. I could be shot. 
So I flew up and down to avoid the shooting. But there is not much the crews on the battleships can do to fight off the enemy. We couldn't shoot a submarine base or IA landing toward him. And we couldn't train our guns toward Fort Island because we could hit part of our superstructure on our own ship. So we were shooting at the high altitude bombers, and we could see all the bursts of our shells way short. The tragic memories have never left Don Stratton. Back at the site where he fought for his life, Don is curious to see what's left of his ship. The team presents Don with the new sonar scans of the wreckage. They reveal a complete image of the sunken vessel. And then we can rotate it in 3D to kind of give anyone who sees it that context. Yeah. The USS Arizona as it rests on the bottom of the harbor today. So from the sonar data, we have tools that can create a solid model like this. An image in astounding detail. Incredible. It's a really emotional place down there, too. It's an emotional for me right here. Don can hardly believe what he sees. We saw this data for the first time, it sort of put the entire ship in context, right? Because mm -hmm. when you're in the water, you can only see a little part at a time. But now we sort of have this overall look. It's just kind of really super hard. So you can it's see all those super, open hatches. Super, super, yeah. yeah. The damage sustained in the attack is not what Don has thought it to be for the past 75 years. It's very surprising that the starboard side is more blown away like this side, because that's where the explosion was. Moments before the explosion, an army doctor on board a nearby hospital ship captures these images of the harbor. The USS Nevada tries to escape the attackers. Speeding away from Battleship Row. Suddenly, a bomb bursts in the water. More planes overhead, American fighter jets trying to chase the attackers. Then the Army doctor points his camera at the USS Arizona. The plume from a bomb that just missed the battleship. The bomb bounced off a number three turret and into the water and went through one right, right through the fantail end of the water. And then we caught the big bomb. 10,000 feet above the harbor, a Japanese Kate bomber has Stratton's ship in the crosshairs. At 8.10 AM, the Japanese commander releases the deadly freight. 
a 1,700-pound bomb constructed for just this purpose. Japanese military planners realized that their aerial bombs were not of a large enough size to do the damage they really wanted to inflict on American battleships. Their solution was simultaneously primitive, but also ingenious. They took 15 and 16 inch battleship shells, large caliber naval uh, projectiles from their battleships and added fins to them and casing around them to make them more aerodynamic. Dropped from 10,000 feet, the shell has a devastating effect. Fireball probably went about 1,000 feet in the air. Close to a million pounds of gunpowder detonates. tearing the ship apart. It was just so devastating. It took so, so, I've been so many men. Over a 1,000, right? 1,177. Yes. The sonar image of the wreckage reveals the extent of the destruction. Here's a, a great look at that oh, yeah. steel and how it just flowered out. Just like paper. People don't realize how it just tore that metal out. Now the entire world can see what Don lived through on that morning. bad day, a terrible day. The Arizona didn't stand a chance. Ship just sank. It was self-preservation then. But how did Don survive such a horrible event? The hair was gone and the skin on my arms it was hanging down like a sock. And how will he react to seeing the inside of his ship? Areas he hasn't seen for nearly 75 years. If we can give him the gift of being able to see in his old ship one last time, in real time, that, that's, that's meaningful for everybody. Will the expedition bring Don's ship back to life? That's our entry point. We are going to feed Ted. Nice. We're in. Watch as world history comes to the surface. No, it's. Wow, look at that. Coming up next. <laughs>